if, if no one has made it known to you, if you've forgotten, I want to remind you uh, that uh, uh, next next Saturday, this coming Saturday, I guess, uh, Christmas Eve, uh, we're going to have in two services at 1 and, and 3 p.m., and we would love for you to join us. If you don't feel welcome, this is your invite from me. Uh, I want you to know that, that we want you there. We want to celebrate together this time of year. And uh, we're having those services early so that you don't get in trouble with grandma or whoever needs you to get to a family party there early enough so that, that you can you can come and, and be with us and still make it uh, to your family gathering. So uh, if you get in trouble with your grandma, that's on you. I'm not going to get a fight with, with grandma. I know that gets really ugly this time of year, so I don't want to do that. So uh, I, wanna, I wanted to let you know something that we always do at our Christmas Eve services, a tradition that we have. We, uh, we have a photo booth there. Uh, we love for, for people to take family pictures and just pictures with their, their movement group and, and the different people they've come with to remember that. And it's something that I uh, love doing. It's kind of become a tradition in our family. I love to post our Christmas Eve photo and, and celebrate that. Uh, but there's something you should know, uh, like the rest of America, I'm lying on social media. And so I always post the, the photo that makes my family look good, right? I post the one uh, where everyone's actually looking at the camera and things look good. Uh, but in the, in the name of honesty today, I wanted to show you some of the pictures uh, from the photo booth last year, because no one knows this. I usually get to see the, the photo booth pictures before they get sent out or before anybody else gets them. So uh, I'm always looking through those and I always think like, well, wait, that's my kid. What's, what's going on there? So I thought I would just take you through our family's history of last year's photo booth. So here's, here's the first one as I was looking through. I found this. I just found my, my daughter randomly taking a solo pic. Now she's cute. Don't get me wrong. She's super cute. But I always wonder, what do the photo booth people think when she just like confidently steps up there and like takes a spot from another family and stuff? So that was, that was one of the, the pics. Here's another one uh, that came up. That's, uh, that's my son Malachi hanging out with the car kids. Uh, they are terrible influences. More on that later. Um, you'll, you'll see that. Uh, here's, here's another pic that happens. So it's not just uh, Mercy. Apparently all of my kids are taking solo pics and like building their headshots up for their career or something. Uh, I'm not sure that's what they're doing, but here's uh, the next one I stumbled on. And now you know why I said the car kids are a terrible influence on my kids because no one else took a picture last year being held by someone. Um, some of you wanted to because that'd be super romantic, but you weren't allowed to do that. But uh, my, my son did. Uh, here's, here's another picture. This one this is where we went a little silly with the props. You know, we put them on there. Now you might be tempted to think, hey, that's a pretty good picture. But the more you look, I don't have eyebrows. And so sometimes if I'm not careful... I can get crazy eyes, right? And uh, and that's what happened there. I was just like, I'm not posting that. People are going to think that I'm like ready to commit a crime or something, and that's not what I want to communicate. So we we took one more picture, and uh, it just wasn't right either. You'll notice again. I'm going to throw myself under the bus and Zion. Uh, a couple of us aren't looking at the camera, and that's a problem because we're going for perfection here. I want this photo to say, man, I want to go to that church, right? And so one more time, this is the best we could do. Everyone's looking at the camera. Everyone's kind of smiling. No one has crazy murderer eyes, and we did our best, and so that's the family photo that we posted. Now, uh, you might see that, and you'd be like, that family has it all together, but you know the backstory, and you know that we don't. And so I want you to know, if you're here today, if you're going to be here on Christmas Eve, if you're bringing some people, and you think, man, we don't, we don't have it together, you're amongst friends, and you're, you're part of my extended family if, if you don't have it together. In fact, I was reminded of that this week. Uh, unfortunately, I, I got contacted by a couple of old friends that said, hey, you haven't known this. Um, I'm going through a tough time. We're going through a divorce. And can, can you and I, can we grab coffee? Can we, can we get together and talk? And so my week, uh, this last week, kind of lacked a lot of the, the holiday spirit that maybe you would want or expect uh, from this time of year. And that got me thinking, man, if just, you know, my week alone, two, two small conversations were able to, to make my, my week feel a little bit different. I was, I was just thinking about a church of our size with multiple services and, and hundreds of people connected. I, I was thinking, what, what are the things that are going on in people's lives right now that, that maybe are not so great? Maybe don't uh, have the, the joy that we think of when we think of the holidays. Maybe aren't things that they're walking up to someone that says, hey, how you doing? And they say, this is falling apart or my life's terrible. We're not often willing to share those things. And, and it, was, it was things I was thinking of, uh, like mental health. I know that this year and every year can be a, a tough time uh, for people just, just with anxiety and all the things that are on their minds. Some of us, I've, I've talked to people in this church that don't know what their job situation is going to be uh, in the new year. I've talked to, to people who would say, you know what, things are pretty good in my immediate family, but we've got to get together with our extended family. And whenever we do that, there's a, there's a little bit of drama. 
right? There are people who would say, yeah, we're, we're trying to hold it together. And my kids don't know this, but Christmas has been all put on one credit card and I don't know how I'm going to pay that credit card off. And so for some of us, we have some financial stress associated with the holidays. And no matter what your, your situation is, no matter what's going on, uh, you, we know that we're going to try and take perfect pictures, right? We're going to try to, to be happy and, and put a smile on. But some of us are wondering, man, what is going on in my life? What is going on with these circumstances? What is God doing? What's happening? Why is this happening to me? Or was, was there another way or a, a better way? And I, I think that sometimes we, we wonder why things are the, the way they are. And so I want to read a, a verse to us today. This is Ecclesiastes 3.11. And it says this, yet God has made everything beautiful for its own time. He has planted eternity in the human heart. But even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. You and I were made in the image of God. We were created in the image of God. And so we have a desire to understand God's plans, to understand what God is doing as he unfolds his plan through history. And I think sometimes we think that's bad, but I want to suggest today that trying to understand God's plan is a good thing. And trying to understand what God is doing is a natural thing. And I think as we get to this time of year, the Christmas story can, can teach us what I want to be our, our big idea for this morning, and it's this. The Christmas story is a reminder that from time to time, God chooses to interrupt our stories in order for us to participate in his greater story of redemption. Redemption is, is simply this. It's, it's a moment where someone is saved or a moment where a debt has been cleared. A story of redemption means that we are off the hook and we are off the hook because of what God is doing and has done. And so we want to look at the Christmas story, the beginning half of the Christmas story, the buildup of the Christmas story today and learn that together. And so if you've got a, a Bible with you on your phone, if you've got one under your chair there, you can turn. We're going to be in Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, it's on page 613. And, and like I said, this is kind of the front end setup, the introduction to the Christmas story. Maybe not the, the famous Luke 2 part that we'll read on Christmas Eve, but this is the part where we can see that God is weaving time and history and making our story part of his story of redemption. Luke Chapter 1, verse 1, page 613 says this. Many people have set out to write accounts about the events that have been fulfilled among us. They use the eyewitness reports circulating among us from the early disciples. Having carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I have also decided to write an accurate account for you, most honorable Theophilus, so you can be certain of the truth of everything you were taught. Well, I'll pause right there and just say this. The four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, tell us exactly what happened in the life and ministry of Jesus. And they were written a generation after uh, the death of Jesus. And all of these Gospels kind of tell a, a different story, different perspective of the life of Jesus. And so if someone were to write a story about me, no one would ever do that because no one would read it. But pretend with me that they would. They could, they could talk about me as a son. They could talk about me as a father. They could talk about me as a husband. They could talk about me as a pastor. And all of those things would be true and simultaneously true. And some of the stories and the circumstances would overlap. And so the Gospels are telling the story of the life of Jesus from a different perspective. And Luke, the author of this, is writing to his friend, his acquaintance, Theophilus, because Theophilus is is curious. Maybe he was a follower of Christ. Maybe he was exploring his faith. But he wanted to know what's going on with this Jesus guy. And so Luke put together an accurate record for him. Because there were a lot of things being said about Christians in those days. Some people would have said, now, Jesus died a criminal's death. I think he was a criminal. So these people that follow him must be criminals. There were other people that would have said, yeah, when Jesus was alive, he he talked about uh, drinking his blood and eating his flesh. And some would say that's a metaphor. But I've heard all these Christians are actually cannibals. And even worse than that, there were other people there. There had been some terrible fires in Jerusalem. And some people said, well, all those fires are because of the Christians. Everyone lost their homes and everyone lost their property and everyone lost their businesses because of the Christians. And so all of these things would have kind of been known and loosely circulating in culture. And so Luke said, listen, I'm going to do all the research. I'm a medical doctor. I'm, I'm studied up. I'm intelligent. I can write this. I'm going to put it together. I'm going to get eyewitness accounts. I'm going to tell you who Jesus was, what happened and how his life unfolded. And Luke's message was simply this, that Jesus came to start a revolution, not a political revolution, but a revolution of love. And so he gets into that story here in verse five, where he says this, 
When Herod was king of Judea, there was a Jewish priest named Zechariah. He was a member of the priestly order of Abijah. And his wife, Elizabeth, was also from the priestly line of Aaron. Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous in God's eyes, careful to obey all the Lord's commandments and regulations. They had no children because Elizabeth was unable to conceive, and they were both very old. One day, Zechariah was serving God in the temple, for his order was on duty that week, as was the custom of the priests. He was chosen by lot to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and burn incense. While the incense was being burned, a great crowd stood outside praying. While Zechariah was in the sanctuary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the incense altar. Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear when he saw him. But the angel said, don't be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer. Your wife, Elizabeth, will give you a son, and you are to name him John. You will have great joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. He must never touch wine or other alcoholic drinks. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth, and he will turn many Israelites to the Lord their God. He will be a man with the spirit and power of Elijah. He will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, and he will cause those who are rebellious to accept the wisdom of the godly. Zacharias said to the angel, how can I be sure this will happen? I'm an old man now, and my wife is also well along in years. Then the angel said, I am Gabriel. I stand in the very presence of God. It was he who sent me to bring you this good news. But now, since you didn't believe what I said, you will be silent and unable to speak until the child is born. For my, my words will certainly be fulfilled at the proper time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah to come out of the sanctuary, wondering why he was taking so long. When he finally did come out, he couldn't speak to them. Then they realized from his gestures and his silence that he must have seen a vision in the sanctuary. When Zechariah's week of service in the temple was over, he returned home. Soon afterward, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and went into seclusion for five months. How kind the Lord is, she exclaimed. He has taken away my disgrace of having no children. So Luke is writing this account of the the life and ministry of Jesus. And before he can really get into Jesus, he has to give us the backstory like any good movie or any good story teller would do. And so Luke first sets up things by telling us about Jesus's cousin, John. Now, this was the man who would later on become John the Baptist. And like Jesus, his birth was was pretty extraordinary. And so the story begins in Judea, where Herod the Great is the king of the Jews. And one of the many priests or in the line of the priest of this time is a man named Zechariah and his wife, uh, along with his wife Elizabeth, they were a faithful couple. They would have been a, a spiritual couple, a, a couple that was steeped in Jewish tradition that people would have looked at and respected and their life was good. But the only thing that, that maybe wasn't so good, the only sadness in their life was that they weren't able to conceive and they weren't able to have a child. And so one day as Zechariah is sent into the temple to burn incense That was a big deal in and of itself. That probably would have only happened maybe once or twice in someone's life. There were, there were so many priests that would do that, that it was a rare thing, but he was going to do that. And while he's in the temple, he has this vision. This angel shows up and tells him and his wife that he's going to have a son. And verses 16 and 17 really start to connect the dots of how long God has been weaving this story together because they tell us how John is, is going to function. He's going to prepare the people for the Lord's arrival and he's going to fulfill the role of Elijah that was predicted back in the book of Malachi in chapter 3 and chapter 4. And so God's been saying, I'm going to send someone. I'm going to send the Savior. And people didn't really know what that looked like. This is when the dots begin to connect. And so an elderly couple having a son is kind of a a miracle, and yet it's not completely out of the ordinary. We've seen it a couple of other times in the Old Testament. We saw Abraham Abraham and Sarah have Isaac against all odds, and we saw Samson and and Samuel were born to barren mothers also. And and so really this has become kind of a a semi-regular thing where God is saying, listen, you think this is impossible? I'm going to do the impossible. And so after a long silence, after hundreds of years, God is on the move again and making this story happen. And Zechariah is looking at this and he's saying like, yeah, 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 that's good, but I don't really believe this. I don't, I don't know if I trust or understand what's going to happen. And, and so if you're, if you're writing this down, here's a list of things that off the record, I think would have been okay to question, right? If, if you had been trying to have a child for that long and you couldn't have a child, you would think, all right, our day's passed. 
That's not going to happen. And then suddenly an angel shows up and says, hey, you're going to have a child. And you're like, yeah, no, that's not going to happen. And then when you do finally realize that's the case, all of a sudden you can't talk about it or, or tell anyone. If I were to rank things in this story that I didn't understand or things that didn't make sense or, or things that kind of felt like an interruption or an inconvenience, those would be some of the ones that, that I would write down. And yet, remember our big idea for this morning, the Christmas story is a reminder that from time to time, God chooses to interrupt our stories in order for us to participate in his greater story of redemption. That story of redemption continues in verse 26. In the six months of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month, for no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. And so when Elizabeth is six months pregnant, this same angel Gabriel appears to this young woman in Nazareth, the town of Galilee, and it's Mary. Yes, that Mary, the the world famous Mary that we know, the mother of Jesus, and she's engaged to Joseph at the time, who's a descendant of King David. And so it's explained that Mary's going to become pregnant by the, the Holy Spirit, the same Spirit who hovered over the water at the birth of creation. And so in this supernatural way, this child will be the son of God. And through Joseph, Jesus was adopted into the line of David as it as had been foretold through prophecy and much of the Old Testament. And so because of the work of Jesus, you and I will be adopted into the family of God. I love that thread and I love those metaphors of adoption in this story. It goes on to say that if John is going to be a prophet like Elijah then Jesus is going to be a king like David. And so you begin to see that God is going to give Israel the king that he's been telling them about, but maybe not in the way they thought would happen. Because this king is going to be greater than David, and his kingdom is going to last forever, and he's going to be called Jesus. And so if you're keeping track of interruptions or things that are weird or things that would make you question, God, what are you doing right now? How's this going to unfold? Why are you doing it this way? Is there another way? You've already got all the things with Zachariah and Elizabeth and them not thinking they could have a child and then having a child and then not being able to talk about that child. And now you've got Mary, who's young not yet married, engaged to be married, and she's pregnant. She's told that she's pregnant with the the Son of God, and so you can imagine that people would start to connect the dots on that timeline, and I'm sure Mary feared people connecting the dots and all the rumors and whispers and things that people would say, oh yeah, she says she's pregnant by, by by God, and the Holy Spirit gave her a baby, but we know that she wasn't married, and The Christmas story, though, reminds us that sometimes God will interrupt our story so that we can participate in his greater story of redemption. And so there's an interruption, and there's something we don't understand, and there's an interruption, and there's something that we wouldn't have planned, and there's an interruption, or there's something that we don't like. And yes, sometimes we have to ask the question, God, what are you doing? And that's okay. The story goes on in verse 39. It says this, at that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zachariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. 
So now when you find out you're having a baby, maybe you FaceTime or text your cousin. That wasn't happening in these days because your cousins lived a few hills over and so you had to go visit. And so we see this interaction happen where Mary goes to visit her cousin Elizabeth, who's kind of her, her older cousin, and they're both pregnant. And so the baby within Elizabeth is, is literally leaping for joy when Mary enters the room because they're both pregnant and because That baby knows that the Messiah is here. The King is here. The Son of God is here. And Mary begins to see and understand and have God's will and God's story affirmed. And she accepts God's will. And she's willing for God to use her life despite this whole plan probably terrifying her. Probably not making sense or probably being uncomfortable and probably making her question things. She says, all right, I'm at peace with this. Because the Christmas story is a reminder that from time to time, God chooses to interrupt our stories in order for us to participate in his greater story of redemption. And so everything is good, right? In fact, in in verse 46, we see that Mary sings a song. And so if this were a Disney movie, this would probably be the closing song where they would kind of tie a bow around everything and, and everyone would hold hands and sing together. And we'd be like, oh man, this is a great plan. And so Mary says this. And Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my savior, for he has been mindful of my, of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. But that is the song that she sang, and that's the close of the movie, right? And that means everything is good. Not quite. In fact, uh, some of the things that would unfold in the life of Mary were, were uh, kind of stressful, if, if I'm being honest. Her pregnancy was, was not textbook. She's told that she's going to have this baby, and just as she's nearing the arrival of that baby, her and Joseph find out that a census is being taken. And so everyone couldn't stay where they were currently living. They had to go back to the land of their ancestors, where they were from originally, so that they could trace these birth lines. And so even though Mary's ready to, to burst with this baby, she's got to make this trip of 100 miles and go to this place called Bethlehem. And yes, I guess she could get on a donkey and not have to walk. And I've never been pregnant, although some of you might think I am right now. Um, I've never, I've never been pregnant. And, and, and if my choices were walking a hundred miles or riding a donkey when I'm miserably pregnant, I, I would say, uh, can I do neither? Right? It's, it's not ideal. And so she, she makes this trip because you, you didn't have a choice and, she, she's probably riding on this, this donkey and things are not going great. And they finally arrive. And, and when they get there to Bethlehem, you know the story, right? There's, there's no rooms available. And not only are there no rooms available, but they eventually basically go to this like makeshift stable and she gives birth in these terrible conditions. And you would think, yeah, that's not been great. She didn't plan the pregnancy. It's not been good. She had to travel, can't get a room, bad conditions. Well, after Jesus has arrived, things go from terrible to to just downright unsafe, right? Because it was announced at that time that, that Herod was threatened and jealous when he heard this new king of the Jews had arrived. And so he was going to take care of this at all costs. And so he was going to put to death every child the age of two and under that was was Jewish. And so Mary and Joseph and Jesus had to flee to Egypt for two years. And Mary saw time and time again that, that her story was not her own and her story was not as she would write it and her story was unfolding in a way that probably made her anxious, probably made her question what God was doing, probably made her wonder what was going on and that didn't stop just when Jesus was young. No, the way that unfolded was that Mary saw Jesus grow up and, and, and he, he lived an incredible life. But he came for a purpose and he came to save people. He came to give his life on the cross. And so even though he'd never done anything wrong, even though he was not guilty of sin, Jesus went to the cross so that he could take on the punishment for our sin and shame. Jesus went to the cross and Mary saw the worst possible thing happen to the best possible person. And her plans, again, were interrupted for God's story of redemption. 
And we see that theme continue all throughout scripture. We see that theme in the lives of the disciples, Jesus' most intimate, closest followers. Their stories were interrupted and changed and moved and inconvenienced because they were following him and they were part of God's story of redemption. We see a man named Saul who God appeared and, and, and changed his name and gave him a vision and called him to ministry. And he wrote much of the New Testament and planted many churches, but his life was up and down and up and down and interrupted. And that's nothing new because we often see see our stories or people's stories interrupted to be part of God's plan of redemption. And when you face interruptions like that, it's, it's fairly normal. It's very okay to say, God, what are you doing? God, why are you doing it this way? God, why is this happening? Wasn't there another way? But I think as we've talked about, the Christmas story reminds us that we're not in control. The Christmas story reminds us that God is in control. And God has not just been in control for small moments. God has been weaving his story of redemption through history and through generations and through people and through time. And he's accomplishing the purpose that he wants to accomplish. In fact, we can take away these four reminders from the Christmas story. That perfect faith is not faith that moves God. Perfect faith is faith that moves us to trust God when he doesn't seem to be moving. See, faith is about trusting outside of ourselves. And so sometimes we'll think, hey God, this is what I wanted you to do. Hey God, this is how I need this to unfold. And that means we're trying to move God rather than trusting him. Faith is when we're trusting God outside of our experiences or our desires. And God has a purpose for our stories that can run counter to what we want or expect. But in those unexpected eruptions, God is at work. God is at work and God is controlling history. And we can learn this, that there's a difference between questioning God and asking God a question. See, when we think of questioning God, we think of doubting God. We think of disrespecting God, or we think of not wanting his plans to unfold. Sometimes we're just saying, God, I'm going to trust you. God, I'm going to move my heart and mind to follow you and follow your lead. I'm just trying to figure out what you're doing because I want to trust you more. And so it's okay to question, God, what are you doing? What's the basis of this interruption? Why has this happened? Was there another way? And it's okay to learn God's plan and God's story and God's way. It's okay to find God's thread of redemption, weaving through your story and trust that. And it's okay to know that your faith is not in vain because your faith is not in faith. It's in a risen Savior who came into this world to save us. And so your, your faith is not just in the fact that you're always going to feel good or you're always going to know what God is doing. Your faith is in a God who said, I move time in history. I am in control. And your faith is in a God who redeems you and saves us and pays the price for our sins by sending his son, Jesus, to die on the cross. See, Mary's story was pretty drastically interrupted. Mary's story was shaken up, and 2,000 years later, you and I are still benefiting from the way that her story was interrupted. You and I are still benefiting from the way that God made this story unfold. God sent Jesus to this world to be born, and that wasn't the end of the story. The story continued because Jesus went from the manger to the cross. In fact, I love this passage of scripture from Isaiah 53 that that really was looking forward and announcing what was going to happen through the story of Jesus. This is one of the many ways that prophecy was fulfilled, and we know that God was making this story happen. This is Isaiah 53.3 telling us what Jesus would do with his life. It says this, he was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care, yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down, and we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream. But he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong and had never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. 
but it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. God sent his one and only son, Jesus, to this earth, not just so we could have something to talk about this time of year. God was weaving time and history and generations and people and circumstances into his story of redemption. And even when we're lost in sin and alone at the end of ourselves and realizing that we don't know what's going on and questioning everything, God reaches out to us and through the life of Jesus offers us peace and offers us life and relationship. And Ephesians chapter 1 verse 11 says this, Furthermore, because we are united with Christ, we've received an inheritance from God. For he chose us in advance and he makes everything work out according to his plan. And that's the beautiful part of this plan. This is not just a plan that happens around us or outside of us. This is a plan that involves us. And because Jesus came and gave his life on the cross as an offering for our sins, even though we've turned our backs on God, as that passage said, even though we've run away from God, even though we've committed things that have separated us from God, even though we have sin in our hearts and our lives, Jesus came and gave his life for us to pay the price for our sin, to redeem our story so that we can know Jesus and have a relationship with him so that we can be brought back into the presence of God and we can know peace and know life and rest in him. But the choice is for us how we will participate in that story. God's told us he has a purpose for everything. And I love the way that Mary responded as she was finding out God's story and how she was involved in it and what his purpose was for her. Mary simply said, I am the Lord's servant. What she meant by that was, this isn't what I planned. This isn't what I thought would happen. This isn't what I anticipated or what I wanted to unfold. But I'm going to choose to believe in what God is doing through me in my story. And I'm going to choose to trust him with my future. And we can be saved by trusting in the work of Jesus. Not that, not that we're good enough, not that we're perfect. But when we trust in Jesus, we're trusting in his finished work on the cross that who he was and what he did was enough to pay the price and the penalty for our sins. And because of that, we can know him and know peace and rest in a relationship with him. The Christmas story reminds us that from time to time, God chooses to interrupt our stories, to, to link them with his story of redemption. And so maybe today the choice that you're being faced with is, is deciding if you're going to trust Jesus in your redemption. Maybe, maybe for the first time, you're realizing that you can't trust yourself. You're realizing that all of the questions, all of the things you didn't understand that didn't make sense, all of the ways that you've walked away from God and felt distant from him now make sense with the context that Jesus is your redeemer. Jesus came and gave his life so that you could know God. And maybe God is asking you for the first time to trust him, to begin a relationship with him, to let him be part of your story for you to experience redemption. If you would love to talk about redemption, if you would love to talk about a relationship with Jesus, about surrendering your life to Jesus and saying, I'm trusting him with my future. I'm depending on him. We would love to talk to you at the next steps table about that today, about beginning a relationship with Jesus. But I think for for many of us, we would say, I I think I, I understand that. I think I know that I have a relationship with Jesus, but I'm still trying to connect the dots of all that's going on in my career, in my health, with my friends, with my family, with my mental health this year. God, what are you doing? And I love the the phrasing of this, that from time to time, God is asking us to participate in his story of redemption. For many of us this time of year, I think the way that God is asking you to participate is simply to announce that the Savior is here, to announce that hope is here, and to pass that hope on to other people. Your friends who don't know what their job situation is going to be, you're being called to pass on hope. Your family that you're going to get together with, whose marriages are crumbling, whose parenting is not working, whose finances are a wreck, and whose mental health is not in a good place, you are the one that's being called to pass on hope and participate in what God wants to do in your family's lives and your friends' lives. You get to pass on redemption, and you get to communicate hope, And that there's a savior who has saved them, who they can trust and walk with and know. You and I get to participate in God's story of redemption. And you and I get to pass on God's story of redemption. Let's be people this year, this Christmas, who are passing on redemption. Who are communicating redemption. Who are excited 
And maybe we're, we're fearful also. Maybe we're questioning also. Maybe we're a little thrown off also. But we're trusting and knowing that God wants to use us to pass on his story of redemption. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for sending your son, Jesus, Lord, first as a baby and then sending him to the cross, Lord, so that we could know you, so that we could be found in you, so that we could rest in you and so that we could be redeemed. God, I pray that you'll just remind us of that, Lord, that you'll let us be anchored in that hope. Help us to trust you as Mary did and simply say, Lord, that we are your servants and we are walking with you, Lord. We may have questions. We may be trying to understand at different moments, but we are trusting you and moving our minds and moving our will to follow you and believe that what you're doing is part of the greatest story and the greatest redemption. God, thanks for that reminder. Be with us now as we respond and as we worship. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.